You are listening to From Embers, a weekly show on CFRC 101.9 FM about anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice. We are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples on land that has come to be called Kingston, Ontario, Canada because of the thievery and brutality of the Canadian state and its empire-loving parents. From Embers is about fires, some real and some metaphorical. Fires started generations ago and tended to over the years. Little sparks all across this territory that we hope will grow, spread, and engulf the thieving state called Canada and the capitalist system that has plagued this land since the fur trade. Tonight on From Embers, you'll hear my conversation with the author of a piece entitled Addressing Russian Propaganda, which you can find online at perleski.org. That's P-R-A-L-E-S-K-I dot org. This interview focuses more on some of the political background of what's going on with the Russian state and really urges people to consider the need to support people in Ukraine fighting off Russian invasion. Our conversation was recorded a few weeks ago now on March 29th, so my apologies for any details which are now out of date. I guess, could you start by um, introducing yourself however you would like or describing a bit in terms of your context, uh, your surroundings, where Mm -hmm. you are, and... uh, Yeah, well, uh yeah. Uh, So... Uh, yeah, I grew up in Russia. Like I'm Russian. Uh, that's that's the first very important point, I guess, for this kind of interview right now. And uh, so I left when I was a student, actually, like on the univers. I mean, student in English, how it is, like university times. And then I kept uh, the contact, and uh, I was into like how to call it now, like anti-authoritarian anarchist, whatever uh, scene, and. Uh, was living in the West, going to the West is like, well, what is the West for you in uh, in Canada? It might be a bit different to understand how Europe is, uh, how people read it. So it's like, let's say everything from Poland <laughs> to the West is West and kind of kind of that. Sure, so let's yeah. say so, Western Europe, let's say. But then, yeah, then uh, about 10 years ago, like a bit less, I was actually, uh, let's say, down with, that, uh, with it. And I spent most of my time going around, like doing like different stuff, like, uh, let's say, in Eastern Europe, like generalizing it this way. In the context of this, of the recent, um, like, Russian military invasion of Ukraine, um, can you describe maybe what's going on either for you personally or people in your broader social networks? Um, you know, when this war started, like in the first stage, it was a big shock, I guess, for most of my environment as well, because I guess we didn't expect it in such, on such scale how it came, like so openly, so big and like just, yeah, just like, uh, a big one, and I guess it's also the privilege of like, people like me who grew up without war and uh, was actually only uh, seeing it from yeah from some distance, you know, and uh, or maybe also like some psychological stuff about like not wanting to believe in some things or like not realizing it, like not being well prepared. It's like some. It sounds for you like quite crazy, even if you try to think about. It. So and uh, yeah, I guess it was like also like a huge mobilization. Let's say that uh, over last year it wasn't part of any like mm, well organized groups or something. Let's say I'm a bit elder. I was like have a lot of frustrations with that, and uh, was living like personal life. Let's say uh, with some. Yeah, some connections to old friends. 
and then yeah it's coming and you're like wow shit happens like it hits the fan people in you say i guess uh in a way so you need to do something i mean i was in kiev actually just a week before the war started uh, by like some personal means and uh so i just left before and yeah we was like joking about yeah not like quite sad jokes about like yeah the troops are closing but yeah the re- for real still thinking that yeah it will be some other like kind of escalation on like uh, more more the level of uh, mm. i don't know saying like some media whatever like some threats but not not really that the bombs will start falling just like just right after i left so mm, and that it will change the life like so crucial can you describe a bit um your context like in terms of um living under like the russian state so to speak or its influence or like um russia as like a military or colonial power and uh sort of the like authoritarian regime that's currently in power Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah it's interesting point because uh you know i grew up in 90s where all this like authoritarian uh, tendencies wasn't very much like visible for us like i mean grew up grew up even like my teenage years and like uh, like early like 90s or 2000s um, so just like i i kind of seen it uh, changing so much because let's say like in 90s and at school i didn't get like even like state flag or like uh president was just uh alcoholics who was like like yes and you may i don't know if you know about it's like like a guy who nobody would like anyhow like respect or something it's like it was just nothing real like people would watch like uh, parliamentary uh shows from like tv and stuff like like as a comedy or something and uh yeah it was very turbulent times in many ways but generally spoken like ideologically from above it was not really so much of a pressure at least i haven't felt that and uh, uh, then, then Putin came into power with a, a Chechen war, like Second Chechen War. They started, and like all this, like what what US got, like with the uh, uh, how do you say, nine eleven, yeah. So in Russia, it was also like this terror, like uh, terrorist attacks, which uh, had like very unclear nature. As for now, it's like uh, some theories were very solid theories behind that. Actually, the secret service was very much involved into organizing it. Uh, but whatever it's, uh, it was like a mass mobilization, um, against, uh, people in Chechnya and uh, a lot of like racist narratives and all this stuff was now we have a new strong leader chef, I guess back then, um, was very young. Like not really still understanding what is going on, and and I guess uh, the topic of uh, of this like colonial nature, in a way, like maybe people wasn't. I cannot remember if people was using this word so much. I don't think so, to be honest. But generally, like this uh, agenda was kind of kind of there. So also like in anarchist uh, anti authoritarian milieus, what was not really the, the case later, like ten years later, maybe like late two thousands. It was not that much anywhere uh, anymore there. So and um, yeah, I don't know. It's like uh, you know, like the, this question. You should you should kind of uh, compare it to something, yeah. Because um, my main point is not that there is like authoritarian regime from above, which is like enslaving people and making them some I don't know cruel monsters, but maybe in a way vice versa that the people have something like in a society in Russia have some something in it that uh, makes exactly such a regime uh, more suitable for so I don't mean of course like bullshit about like genetics and stuff please don't misunderstand it this way I mean of course like uh, some like uh, historical narratives and what we was learning at school like later I was realizing it more and more that even in this uh, yeah being like uh, Russian what and being like growing up there what it actually brings and uh, I guess uh, this immigration experience uh, was a big deal to see how things changing from from a side like coming and going to visiting your family and friends and seeing like how things are changing uh, what what was not maybe so much visible for people inside 
to them. Um, so because you kind of hear like don't don't see it so much so well like from the close distance sometimes I guess, and uh, so yeah, um, and yeah, it changed like very much like in, like just in practical way that uh, let's say like mid two thousands and two thousands. Like political actions sure it was like quite some violence from the police uh, but uh, generally spoken uh, political persecution in terms of like long-term sentences and stuff wasn't really there so you, you would i mean i got like only a little bit of that but uh, the things that was like sentenced for i don't know 20 bucks like us dollars uh now you can go for like several years in jail you know for for the same so it's uh it's it's kind of a big change like uh, of style yeah and uh i guess it's not that uh all the repressions and uh they was there they was just not uh, against uh, people in metropoli maybe so much you know i guess on the periphery it was definitely there i mean war was going on and a lot of practices uh, which people like which, which police and not only political police but usual police is using against uh, uh, people in jail or like in police stations always torture uh, they are not like falling from the sky they they was learning it in uh, like war regions they was uh, learning it they was torturing I don't know some Chechen people there so then they was doing the same with like uh, how to explain for proclaimed criminals or whatever like you know people they they yeah outside of the those regions so it was like Kind of, it's very well described in uh, some like literature on colonialism. You know how it's like uh, this kind of colonial boomerang. They they call it the word boomerang in English, right? Yeah, I'm not really sure. So, um, so yeah, I guess uh, this kind of change of regime was uh, going on with time, and uh, maybe after 2012 or some 2012. Like, yeah, around that, after like this Balotna case and stuff, it's like kind of crystallized more. And uh, with Crimea, like annexation and uh, war with Ukraine, 2014, and like a uh, military invasion there, uh, it was also like this mass mobilization, uh, which like uh, was also showing that uh, the ideology which, which was developed, uh, like. Uh, created like recreated like in 2000s uh that it became more of like actual actual thing of the state because i guess when putin came at power and uh, um, it was like starting to to change like his he in person his team whatever how we call it like they was uh, changing the political um, life like in the country like how it's organized like centralizing it like uh, gaining more power and uh, the yeah eliminating enemies and uh, like changing political field i don't think there was so much into ideology actually it was like trying different ones i mean 2004 there was like a first maidan movement in ukraine and the uh, government changed so so they in Russia like really got fear that it might change uh, their positions too, and uh, I guess they this generation of old uh, people from security service and so on they they really didn't got like a well education in uh, social sciences and uh, their understanding of societies around them and their own society is very rigid like very simplistic and uh, i guess they really believe in like this conspiracy theories and stuff like that somebody from above is like influencing people and and so they need to be in control somehow so they started to um, to try to control like the streets in some way like creating some political parties and uh, i guess uh, it, it wasn't like intentionally that uh, they created this uh, thing like uh, created adopted this uh, like red brown stuff like this mixture of like stalinism and uh, old even like monarchism let's say and like right-wing elements i guess it was more of like trial and error that uh, it just worked better and uh, also that the people they got to work for them uh, <laughs> uh, was like mostly good in that and coming mostly from that corner um, so it's why uh, I guess it's changed in this way. I wanted to ask you to 
describe sort of the idea of of anti-fascism in Russia or how that is sort of used by the state um, or even sort of like also the presence of more like a political anti-fascism that's not necessarily like a anti-authoritarian or like resistance thing um, but more like a narrative used to uh, justify and motivate um, the Putin regime's forces I guess like yeah I wanted to ask you to talk about or describe um, fascism and the idea of anti-fascism in the context of Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what is maybe hard to understand that it's like state ideology, first of all, uh, that the relation to the Second World War and uh, particular how people call it, it's like a great fatherland war in Russia. Uh, it's maybe the main historical narrative at all. So, uh, you know, in 90s, mm, not in only 90s actually, but in 90s it was very visible that the state and like similar institutions, it was like desperately looking for like some tradition they can appeal to, you know, and like maybe to mobilize people and stuff. And uh, the story of the Second World War was quite well suited for, uh, because uh, it gave the opportunity to to mobilize people without any um, appeal to any wallows or something, you know, because it's absolutely empty. It's like the, the main thing is like to oppose the invaders, you know, the idea of the war, Second World War, or like it's, it's seen more in the tradition of uh, invasion, like mostly Western invasion. Uh, it started in the 30s already like late late 30s and maybe maybe like during the second world war it was like crystallized more like in stalin times so that actually the russian state like uh, was always attacked like some invaders was coming like from teutons it's like german kind of thing like in 13th century and then alexander nevsky was like fighting that or like Polish people was like uh, taking Moscow in the beginning of 17th century and then was fought back or like Napoleon was coming and actually Napoleon war war with Napoleon like uh, it was like the first fatherland war like just a fatherland war you know the second war is a great fatherland war or this Napoleon is a usual like fatherland war it was also one of the main narratives in 19th century and uh, it was also times when the Russian nation was built let's say like uh, when it was like fulfilled, like finished, or like if if you can say it all that this process is finishing any time in history. Uh, so the main narratives was like that the invaders are coming, uh, the in, the invaders like facing not just like some political group or like some particular party in the government or something, but they facing like the whole Russian nation, like the whole Russian like people, you know. So the people are uniting around some idea or like some idea of like land or something and uh, fighting back and then destroy this uh, threat yeah and so uh, for the second world war for the great fatherland war it's crystallized in the idea that uh, the invaders are like essential treat not only for russia but like for the whole world yeah it's like nazis and like nazis yeah german nazis they are like the big threat without any idea actually what exactly is the threat you know it's just like they are just evil yeah they just want to to destroy everything you love whatever but what exactly it's like not clear they're just coming and destroying so we have to be united and united in around a leader in the end you know like how it was like in stalinism you know? like around the leader or around at least like the leading party or the state the idea of state uh, so because historically seen like second world war in the territories of ex-soviet union now it was like such a multitude of different like uh, armed groups partisans uh, and then like some different forces of like state nation this this that collaborants and so on and uh, the narrative which uh, which uh, is actually shared by by the society is that there's like only two sides 
yeah nazi germany and uh, the good guys <laughs> so ours like red army or like how 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 are people call it so and uh, in this like world view uh, anti-fascism is not anyhow connected to any like values you know it's like actually uh, not really clear like how you distinguish between fascist and and not fascist uh, it's just an enemy it's just like uh, just everything evil you know like being fascist because like in soviet union and later in russia like this theories of uh, like uh, what is fascism and stuff i wasn't really developed so and uh, so this kind of way of seeing that makes it very easy to uh, to feel um, feel this uh, story with whatever particular groups you know and so it's more about symbolic maybe you know like what is easier to see yeah if somebody have a like swastika it's a fascist if not if like red star or something that that's anti-fascist or something like that and then even even more that russian is like per se essentially anti-fascist yeah and everybody who is against russians is a fascist then yeah and uh, already before the second world war and then during and after um the central government of russia like adopted like this kind of russian chauvinism or like how you would call it back then uh like playing with that and like playing using mm. so and there was also resistance to it yeah so there was like occupied territories uh, like the new ones in the west for example not only in the west but also there so there was like mass ethnical like deportations which with amount of uh, casualties or like amount of like people dying during that you can call cleansings or like how you call it like ethical cleansings or something yeah so repressions let's say uh, so uh, so yeah the central state uh, narratives was calling these people who was uh, opposing it also like fascists yeah and then was using this idea of like nazi collaborators because at some point like nazis was using uh, some nationalist forces uh, uh as a collaborator units during the war uh like i mean interesting point about that it's like the the russians was actually the biggest one like uh, if you would see like uh the amount of uh, like how big this units was yeah but nobody's talking about that people only talking about like so-called like traitors you know traitor nations like they call it like completely like traitor nations and uh and uh, these are like the most unloyal ones and then yeah like people who was not uh uh, loyal enough and was uh, resisting yeah it's like uh, the whole like periphery mostly of soviet union is full of such stories yeah like how the central government was uh, oppressing the uh, resistance and like uh, repressing people so this uh, and this repressions would be calling like uh, the anti-fascist one in the end you know
You're listening to From Embers, airing first on CFRC 101.9 FM. We're also a proud member of the Channel Zero Anarchist Podcast Network. We'll get right back to my interview with a guest speaking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But first, here's a jingle from another Channel Zero show. Listening to Dissident Island Radio. Live every first and third Friday of the month at 9 pm GMT. Check out www.dissidentisland.org for downloads and more. And uh, also, like this, uh, particularly like this propaganda about traitors, not just the people as traitors, but like collective uh, guilt of uh, several nations. Like, for example, how it was like with Ukrainians and like uh, their movements, yeah, which is now mm, Russia is like calling to it a lot. It's like that the figure of uh, Ukrainian uh, as such, like during like, uh, I don't know, 19th century and even before already was connected with the idea of threat, like in the Russian nationalism, like uh, on the very early stages. Uh, a bit like simplistic and speculative, yeah, to say um, when Russian na- nation was built, uh, like modernization came like in uh, 18th century with Peter the Great and later like stuff maybe even before. Uh, uh, the uh, there are like different uh, ways to to define your your own nation, yeah. Through the othering, it's like very familiar. Like you have like others, yeah. Let's say like people who are who who are not white, who have like other race, or like like who are definitely like others, yeah. It's like for for Russia, it would be like people in Central Asia, native people, or like people from Caucasus uh, and so on. But with um, other Slavic folks, yeah, like Belarus or Ukraine, it's different. So they it's not like they are not others. They uh, Russians refuse uh, the right to exist to them. So it's like uh, the the way of uh, of like uh, they, they would be like kind of somehow broken Russians, you know, somehow uh, polluted by the West or something. Yeah. So like some something invented and uh, so traitors. Yeah. So that they was like polluted by the West and uh, they are not willing to be Russians. Yeah. They they kind of sin and they trade is that they not accepting not just the rule of uh, Russian like Tsar or like central government, but they are <laughs> not thankful enough uh, that just to dissolve in the body of the Russian nation. Yeah. So yeah. in this, in this way, it's like t- even to declare I am, I'm Ukrainian. I am Bel- like from Bel- Belarus. Uh, it, it's already a threat. Yeah. Uh, it's already something which cannot happen. And it's a, uh, why now Russia is like what they call it Nazism now, yeah? It's actually the, the very idea of independence, the very idea of uh, being not loyal to the central government is uh, actually fascism for them, you know? Uh, so, and uh, uh, of course they are also using like this facts of uh, uh, collaboration history of some like groups uh, during the second world war, it's like easy to find, you can find like everybody there, you know? It's like Russians, whoever. So it's it's not a big deal to do. So, but the the way is like what you will highlight and how you will use it uh, in a modern propaganda. That's the point, yeah. So, and uh, then it's like a big denial of even like existence of Ukraine. They're saying uh, Ukraine was created by Lenin or Ukraine was created by Austrian-Hungarian bureaucrats or whatever. You know, they will just. Uh, not even like kind of see it as an enemy they will see it like uh, as a puppet of of the west or something you know it's like uh, there is no such thing you know as ukrainian and so uh, the idea of uh, this denazification for putin now it's like uh, they see it as liberation you know from uh, how it is like yoko like uh, from uh, from the 
foreign rule or something, yeah, that people should be like very thankful for, you know, that you kind of make them good again, you know, they was like suffering under, I don't know, Western rule or something, and now Russians will come and, uh, and he will liberate them, you know, that, that's uh, the idea of like, uh, uh, like how this propaganda ideologically works, you know, like what they try yeah. to sell. Yeah, I, I totally understand, like, um, how that would be awful and bad um, to be experiencing as someone who lives in Ukraine and uh, sees, like, a necessity to fight against the Russian invasion. Um, what, like, do you see a position or a way to do that or to support that that doesn't depend on... Um, supporting the Ukrainian state or participating in a specifically Ukrainian nationalism? Like, is there another um, sort of way that people can think about that struggle? And does that, yeah. is that a current that exists um, on the ground that you know of also? Yeah, I mean, the thing is right now that uh, it's not such there is no such a luxury of like choosing uh, between like ideologically right or not so so much like you know like what do you like so much it's like it's a question of survival uh, so i'm not in a position to judge people for whatever so choices and uh, i don't see like uh, um, like my position is like people first should survive and i want to support them in that uh, and then will be like seeing like well what is going on you know and uh, um so i guess what what is like uh, with anarchist it's like uh, <laughs> an anarchist myself you know it's like the thing is like that uh yeah don't support the state okay like uh, how far you will go with not supporting the state yeah it's always the question yeah uh, we are like using i don't know like uh uh, I don't know, water water supply, like, in my house is, like, built by the state, you know, I mean, this house not, but, like, uh, whatever, like, how far you will go, yeah, of supporting, not supporting the state, what, what is, what is more interesting for you, being, like, uh, like, having, like, puristic view on, uh, to, uh, to show off among your, like, small circle, or, like, literally, like, achieving something, yeah, so, and, uh, like, achieving something, in a, like, in a way of, like, how society is changing, or, like, uh what kind of like mm, or like not changing or like maybe just <laughs> surviving in a way yeah like w we have now the situation where you have like russia which is like politically black hole there is like nothing there it's like everything which reach this like gravity disappears that's it like uh, you could see it like uh, when we're coming back to ukraine like when crimea was annexated pe people who was politically active needed to escape that's only the option I mean, barely, yeah. It's like, at least to say, that's uh, not comparable uh, how much you can do in Ukraine, like uh, this kind of, like, more like bourgeois democracy, whatever society, how you call it, or like in Russia, which is like getting more and more authoritarian, and uh, now you might call it fascist. So there is definitely a difference for opportunities in this different society. So, and now it's connected to... In, in extinction it's connected to uh, the, the fact that russian army is now uh, using the tactics which means like completely destroying like not just like ideologically something no just fucking with people like really literally like bombing people away like completely like the cities the the houses the like killing like thousands like thousands and ten thousands of people you know it doesn't matter whom it's a part of it's a part of the tactics like military tactics so uh, and uh, the ideology uh, behind it uh, is quite scary i mean they was first talking about denazification of like some political parties or whatever now they they like maybe about a week two ago like not only some like radicals from internet but like people on the like state tv and so on they started to talk about look Ukrainians are refusing to accept our rule. They, they're strange. It looks like they're, all of them are Nazis. So, and what they are doing now, for example, with uh, people who, who they, we don't have like, we, who they uh, kidnap or I don't know how maybe like let them go, like from Mariupol to, to Russia, I, 
they kind of starting like this uh, how it is in english correct call like filtration camps you know concentration camps where they they nazificate these people first and then deport them somewhere deep in russia or like it's not really we don't have like that much facts to uh, describe it very, very like uh, well, but it's definitely uh, something. Uh, I don't like these big words usually, but it's a fucking genocide. Like what is going on? And then you know, and then now talking about like to support this or to support that, it's like uh, great actually if we would have this opportunity so 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 well. And there are initiatives uh, who are like more horizontal, and actually the most initiatives like. Uh, Russia, uh, Ukrainian state is not that strong to organize everything. It was uh, not not in any sense, not in sense of military, not in sense of uh, bureaucracy and so on. So it is re it does relies on like self organized organized initiatives as well. So and uh, so mm, there is uh, not just like a vertical uh, top down. Uh, organizing there, yeah. The most of things, I mean, like uh, our comrades now and like friends, uh, how they organize it's like horizontal from people to people, you know. And uh, in this way, <laughs> there are like plenty of opportunities to support, yeah. So, and uh, and also, yeah, maybe not everybody's waving like circle A, yeah, but uh, what is happening. Uh, I would call it uh, very close to to what uh, anarchists call like anarchism in in terms of organizing and, and like real on the ground, yeah. like mutual aid. Yeah. What is going on? A lot. So, and uh, the thing about like nationalism and like nationalist mobilizations and stuff. So you cannot avoid uh, <laughs> to have it like in a like in a war and uh, in our century. So in a, in. A, in this uh, time, so um, I'm not. Don't think I'm the right person to <laughs> to question too much about. You know, I don't um, see myself in the position, like you know, to to judge and to 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 make like uh, some fancy analysis on that right now. I guess uh, <laughs> we should ask people in Ukraine about. Sure. Yeah. I guess I can yeah. speak for Russia, and uh, I can uh, I can talk more about like Russia. What what the fuck is that? I'm sorry for uh, language. I mean, so. I'm glad. I think that's an important perspective to share, honestly, because it's you know speaking to people in the West who are like living under Western imperialism and NATO, et cetera, et cetera. It's like uh, it is a a choice in a sense of like, oh, how do you want to? talk about this struggle or how do you want to support it or encourage other people to support it and you know I mean I personally do think that people who are suffering under this invasion and or suffering under living under this regime deserve our support like you know just ordinary people they're not um, it's not the state or something and it what am I trying to say yeah it's just that like uh, I think critical solidarity is important but i think it's i agree that it's sometimes like easier to fall back into sort of purist um apathy or something and i don't think that's good no sure so i mean it's a very comfortable position you know like to to be so like judge and then the problem of this position is that people are following sometimes like just somebody who is like uh, <laughs> who is just uh, presenting what people want to see you know like I don't know if I if I'm clear. So it's like uh, you want somebody who is waving circle circle A. People will wave circle A. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, for sure. I don't know if if there are like doubts of supporting and how people in Ukraine. I I don't know how to talk like forward like to touch people like doubts in terms of like read it. Okay, just die because I'm not really completely sure if if I will support your initiatives of buying like some medical supply or like uh, I don't know like uh, collecting money for another car to drive like refugees from the border. Maybe it will so somehow support the nationalism. So just fuck off. I mean. Uh, <laughs> What, yeah. what, what, what we are talking about, you know, like really in this case, I, I, I just don't know. This kind of discussions are like disgusting. I guess uh, there are times for discussions. There are times for when it's maybe too late. Uh, I mean, it's it's more about uh, 
people with my background, even I'm not living in Russia for ages, uh, still I have like some responsibility for what happened. Like, uh, I mean, yeah, I was like, I told you like, and you actually know that, that uh, I'm not just wasn't supporting the state, but I tried to do something like against this uh, ideology, like propaganda and stuff, but uh, not enough. So it's absolutely clear. And uh, that's also the point now. So that uh, it, it's a point to think about that. Like, well, what, 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 what actually was a fail? Like, what, what, what was a, what should be done? Like, and what we can do now? Do, do now? So, and I guess, uh, so yeah. And the part of this dynamics of uh, like uh, looking from the center to the periphery in this very colonial way of like judging people like in a way of like using the frames you created yourself for them so and then just like picking the position so like picking something which suits uh, your own analysis like in the in the center like just to feed up your own uh, i don't know theories or like everyday just uh, subcultural like attitudes life you know to just uh, using like some references uh, how it happens like the solidarity movements a lot i don't know if you understand what i mean <laughs> so i think so uh, yeah so i guess people will understand so that's uh, definitely not solidarity how, how I, would... I wouldn't call it solidarity to be honest something else sure but and uh, it doesn't mean that people are evil doing that. I mean, uh, the intentions are great. And uh, the problem is like the ways it's canalizing, like maybe even some empathy and some like uh, willing to make something good. It's like, so yeah. And yeah, critical solidarity, sure, sure, absolutely. But to have like critical solidarity, first you need to, to have a very good connections to people. And uh, it's not something you create like just uh, in a few seconds, you know. Like, it's not that you're just calling the hotline of, like, uh, help and then, like, yeah, <laughs> you help. No, it's like uh, you need to have the contact between movements, like solidarity ones, for sure. So, but, yeah. So it's actually maybe the point as well to do so. <laughs> Especially yeah. right now, it's like uh, to reduce uh, people in Ukraine to some uh, victims. It's uh, absolutely bullshit. Like people showing such a uh, like the will and to, to resist and to like to like we should learn. I mean, it's not something like uh, <laughs> that. Some cool guy somewhere in, in the West would be like now like teaching people. No, no, come on, just uh, take a look. Like some I don't know some peasant uh, villagers from from Ukraine will maybe teach you something like me too. <laughs> So, how to self-organize, like, well, you know, under, under these circumstances, I guess uh, it's like the approach should be a bit different. <laughs> so, what would you hope to, to see in that regard? Or like, in terms of people either offering meaningful support um, or trying to build connections with, with people and movements? Um, what do you think would help people do that? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now it's maybe not a good time for big discussions with people on the ground. Yeah, it's like uh, something. Yeah, people are let's say busy. Yeah, so I, I guess it's clear. So, but uh, yeah, to establish like uh, connections and support. <laughs> that, that's. Uh, mm, yeah, I guess it's uh, right now it's quite easy. It's just like people need resources, people need uh, yeah some uh, yeah resources in the first line. I mean, uh, there are some initiatives you you might be linking later. So it's uh, actually quite a lot. You you could see like in Europe, for example, how people organize uh, in uh, helping refugees or like people organizing like uh, to deliver some like material resources not just money but also like some stuff which is now complicated to get like in ukraine itself and like delivering it and uh, like people going there to to do stuff as well so it's like um, i don't know maybe i 
yeah, it's uh, <laughs> somehow it's so obvious, and somehow maybe maybe yeah, so much questions are rising still. I don't know. Maybe you you should be more precise. You know? That makes sense. Um, because yeah, in a sense, it is kind of obvious. But I, I guess I feel motivated by like um, sort of identifying the the obstacles to people doing that. Um, like, which I think one of them is this sort of like kind of purist attitude. Um, but maybe that's not the only obstacle. I think maybe also sometimes another obstacle is like which you kind of spoke about earlier is like some of the confusion around like who is a fascist and who is like not a fascist and what is you know like people have this like uh, I think it comes from a good place like this like strong desire to not help far right or fascist movements grow because it means a lot of violence and misery for many, many people in the world, like, I respect that. But um, I think there is a lot of, like, confusion and disinformation and stuff um, about different actors in these conflicts. So even, you know, talking about that, like, state narrative of Mm anti-fascism and whatever is, like, I think helpful. Uh, I guess it's like disidentity for politics is just like not really helpful. It's uh, because, you know, if somebody calls himself uh, anti-fascist uh, or fascist, even sometimes like, I mean, fascist is maybe less fashionable word right now, but it doesn't really mean anything. It's just a word, guys. I mean, first clarify for yourself. What do you mean with anti-fascism? What exactly do you mean? Or like fascism? So when you clarify it for yourself, what you exactly you mean to for the fascism, you know, with fascism, what is that? What are like particularly like, what is that? Like if you have, I don't know, racist attitude, it's clearly more clear, yeah? Or like homophobia, it's like more clear. Okay, somebody's homophobic, like, okay, I don't want to work with them. All right, or not all right. So, you know, more precise. And then if you have it like for yourself, then maybe you will be checking it better. Like, you know, how many fascists you need in a group to consider it a fascist group, you know, like, uh, is it like uh, sure. if in the army of, I don't know, Canada, or like, uh, let's say like a cell or like in the police, like, yeah, are like three Nazis, is the whole police or like whole unit Nazi or not, you know, and, and so on, you know, just like be more precise for yourself, maybe, you know, and be like more consequent, like more consequent with this like judgments, you know, I guess the p- big problem is that people don't know themselves what they mean and uh anarchist this once leftist whatever what exactly do you mean like for yourself first of all you know <laughs> then you it maybe will be more clear like mm, on the other side of the globe you know what, what do you mean because then th- don't follow the symbols like that much don't follow the words we, we, which might mean something completely different it's exactly the point with russia it was like very visible after 2014 when like uh, in Western Europe, like all these groups, not only Stalinists, but the groups who who see like red flags and Hamann Zikel and so on and so on as something fashionable. They were seeing like literally Nazis from Russia, like there was such groups like on the Russian side who was also waving these flags because they understand it different. They understand it as a uh, sign for a big, strong empire and uh, like national interest blah 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 very much like computes very well with their like ideology of uh, i don't know like the other parts of like uh, leadership like nationalism uh, racism homophobia and so on and so on you know like the the things uh, which are easier to localize let's say as ideology yeah and in a particular group or in a particular like people and then you also might be like more precise of understanding okay like if you have like i mean all this like think about like uh, looking for fascist or anti-fascist everywhere and like defining everything along uh, like this uh, uh, lines uh, is a trap i would say like especially if it's like mostly symbolic thing so you know it's like very identitary trap and uh, it might work very well for like uh, your local context because you know it you know, you know, you know who's a fascist. I mean, just remember, I don't know if you do, like 2000s when autonomous nationalists appeared in Europe. Yeah, people were so confused. Like some Nazis or not Nazis, so who is that? They wear the same clothes. 
use the same symbolics, play the same music, go to the same gigs, like whatever, making hip hop and stuff. Like old school boneheads was gone. You know, like this 90s style, like 80s style, where it was clear, okay, you see like Nazi bone, like Nazi skinhead, Nazi bonehead, very clear, like people showing, uh, how's in English, uh, Zikaya, like Hitler groups, whatever. Yeah, and uh, where they're like into Hitler and stuff. Whoops, it changed. And then people are so disoriented. Like the whole movements, like in, I don't know, some ecological groups and stuff, like in, in, uh, environmentalists, yeah. And so on. they was like just hijacked by, by right wingers because people was not able to identify them because they was looking only for symbols and stuff, yeah. So in this case, it's uh, playing uh, into hands of Russia for sure because sure, Russia defeated fascism, yeah. It's a fucking state ideology there, yeah. And uh, what was uh, what what is, what is the idea behind it right now? Yeah? So, I mean, it's quite obvious right now for everybody. Yeah, I mean, at least like in the regions here. So it's it's quite clear. Yeah. So, but uh, it seems to be not so clear even in Western Europe still. So, I guess I had heard reports about like people fleeing Ukraine maybe specifically from Mariupol uh, ending up in Russia or that um, some of these like so-called like humanitarian corridors were leading to Russia, which was maybe not actually very safe or um, whatever. And that some people are now being held in camps. Um, can you maybe describe that situation or talk about what's happening there? Yeah, I guess the information is quite limited on that uh, purpose. Uh, there are like official uh, reports from like Ukrainian government organizations uh, that uh, they consider it kidnapping, or, like I guess a yeah, correct word, like kidnapping of uh, Ukrainian uh, citizens to Russia. And yeah, Russia is uh, definitely not following uh, uh, this kind of thing with like humanitarian corridors. They are still shooting on people. There are like enough uh, proofs on that. So. Uh, and yeah, from Mariupol, it's very close to uh, to Russia, and it's also very close to occupied territories in the eastern Ukraine. So, yeah, looks like uh, they put the people there. Are like some evidences, uh, which uh, which I can believe very easily, and uh, there is like proofs and stuff that uh, yeah, they put uh, people in this like concentration or filtration camps, like uh, people disappearing, they are first checking like if uh, like loyalty or like whatever they consider not uh, uh, a threat for Russian state or like some institutions. So if you are like relative of somebody who's in the army or like whatever, you know, like checking you like phones and like social networks and stuff. It's definitely not how refugee are, refugees are coming and then like invited and stuff. And then there are like reports about that uh, they make proposals you can't really say no uh to go to work to some like very remote regions for example and uh, that they kind of disperse people as well and and so on i might believe that some people might be better going to russia than to die so it's absolutely possible but uh yeah it's like uh, there should be a lot of investigations on that like done which is uh, now i guess due to situation not so easy to do so we should definitely keep an eye on that and uh, the politics what uh, like russia is doing it seems to be they, they it's not only mariupol you know there was like uh, some cities uh, also on the like borders of uh, like closer to kharkiv and it's in uh, donbass region uh, which i raised completely like they are doing very similar stuff like in chernigov as well which is like a different region um so so yeah, they kind of destroying not from very day first. They wasn't only aiming on like military objects. They was like, but after some point when it was clear that uh, there is some resistance, they start uh, to erase like yeah, I repeated it many times. Yeah, they just erase like civil uh, areas and uh, this camps and so on. It's like definitely can be a part of that. I mean. Uh, you, you should understand that a lot of troops, uh, which they actually uh, accumulated and uh, who was invading Ukraine, wasn't uh, like a usual army, let's say. It was uh, more like a police. 
you know, because I guess they was mostly expecting that there will be no military resistance, so they will just uh, take the territory and the and what they will do is like more or less like what they're doing in Russia, like was uh, controlling the population, you know, not not uh, having an actual military fight. So and uh, yeah, this <laughs> people are doing it all the time. So and. Uh, mm, they have like some experience with that. So. Are there specific things that I haven't asked you about yet, but that you feel are important to mention or that you specifically wanted to highlight? I want to add one thing as a person who was born in Russia and uh, was raised as a Russian, um, that Russia as a state, as a cultural reference, as a national project, uh, is a threat for everything I love, everything I stand for, and it should perish. It should never happen again. And it should be very clear that uh, Russia never again. <laughs>